أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات كانت لهم جنات في الدوس نزلا خالدين فيها لا يبغون عنها It's an open discussion, uh, not a closed discussion. So we have uh, obviously Dr. Hani with us, and we can ask him 
uh, questions, alhamdulillah. We've had many questions people have been sending in online, alhamdulillah, as well. But the main discussion, the main uh, talk today will be about um, our generation, Generation Z, you could say, and how the previous generation, I would say, led or paved the way for this generation now, and how can this generation now move forward, inshallah. But in order for this generation to move forward, we need to learn from the previous generations. We need to know what they did, the steps that they took, and what we can do, and maybe if we could do better as well, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, First of all, I'd like to thank Brother uh, Mikhail for his beautiful recitation, which we all enjoy such a recitation, alhamdulillah. And uh, before we start the discussion, we have two kinds of discussion, since we are in an open space. We've got open space discussion and the closed space discussion. If you travel with me in a car, on a train, plane, ship, okay, it's a closed space discussion. So you are locked in with me for an hour or two or three or four hours. Don't ever waste the journey of the closed space discussion because time is life. When you are in a car, on a train, or on a plane, use the time if you are in a group with your colleague and discuss very important issues. This is the closed space discussion, which I tried very well with young people like you from generation are you from the millennial or from the Z? Uh, from well, I was raised in the millennium, you see. Okay. I was born in the Anyway. Uh, so, this is number one. The open space discussion, we are in a cafe now. There's another challenge. Anybody can walk in, because we have put this advert of today's discussion on the Facebook. Anybody that would not know, he or she can walk in to ask any question they want. This reminds us with the philosophy of discussion at uh, what do you call it in London, Hyde Park corner and other places when people stand in the middle of the square, round about, road in front of a shop or a mosque or a church and start open discussion with the common or with the public. This is the open space discussion. Open space discussion allows the young people to walk in, casual, with no preparation, nothing, no formality, when they can sit with somebody like you, as a star, or as a scholar, or as a philosopher, or as a thinker, and listen to you, and ask you a question. This is the difference between open space discussion and the closed space discussion. And this something, we'll give it forward for Generation Z, or the Millennial Generation, which was born at, was the Millennial here? In the world? 81 to 96. You are not 81. Z. Z. Huh? Z. You are Z. I am, I am what? Uh, I assume uh, Z as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not G. I'm, I'm OG. OG is something which one of the Z's brothers or sisters called me one day that I'm an OG, the original gangster. So this discussion of generation gap since last century, before last century, uh, from the beginning of the 20th centuries, people start about def different definition to different generation. Like 1901 to 27, they call it the greatest generation. I don't know why, but we'll discuss this in another discussion, another lecture that I'm preparing. Then from 19. 28 to 1948, this is silent generation, because this is after the First World War and to the Second World War, the post-Second World War, between the two World War. 
Then from uh, 46 to 54, which is my generation, they call it boomers two, no, no, boomers one, or baby boomer. I'm a baby boomer generation. I'm baby or not yet. Generation Z, which is your generation nowadays, brother, what, what is this? Brother, uh, uh, Mikhail is generation Z, okay, which is from actually uh, 1997 to 2012. So the discussion started in Turkey two weeks ago between me and generation Z. I told them the millennial generation in the West have managed to create the social media technology. And what our millennial generation have done, watching the millennial generation in the West of creating their, actually, social media technology. Facebook, Twitter, actually, and the others. So we should not be a generation, the millennial generation, or the Z generation, just watching what the others are doing. It should be creative. Generation Z, like yourself, what have you achieved? Your generation have achieved in their time. Are we following the definition of the West and following it blindly, following them blindly, or we are creating another wave of technological development that we can lead. Generation Z, when they meet with somebody like me, between you and me, is uh, about four generations or three generations. We should have something in common, and we should build the bridge between us. You come and take the experience, we sit down to show you the experience. You drive us with energy, with power, with motivation, with zealousness. And we give you the wisdom and the history and the values and the moralities. Not because you have the technology. Not because you have the power of the speed of technology, of communication, that you look down at generation baby boomer. I'm a baby boomer one. Is that right? Yeah. And is you, who was baby boomer two? 55 to 64. Oh, this is four or five years after myself. My father's generation. Yeah, your father. Because me and your, 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 your father are baby boomer one and baby boomer two, but we're still producing generation Z. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing. How can we bring the gap? between the two generations without arrogance. Why this come to me every now and then? Because sometimes people become arrogant to their fathers or to mothers by saying, oh my God, my father is not educated. My father or my mother does not speak English. My father is not, or my mother is not qualified from a university. This kind of shame is shameless from generation, millennial generation, or generation Z, because your father and my father and others, baby boomer one or two, are the people who laid down the foundation for you to stand on and be this generation, which is enjoying the fruits of the technology and the education and the communication. This is the generation gap, which we need to discuss it and bring it uh, closer. So just um, leading on from that, so talking about uh, your generation, Baby Boomer 1 and then Boomers uh, 2 as well, then we have uh, Generation X also in that as well. Um, you've obviously, uh, you've come from that first generation, Boomers 1, in uh, 40, uh, 44 generations ago. I'm a Z. <laughs> Are you Z? Generation Z? Uh, probably after that, no, 
Yeah. I think Z, maybe yeah. Z. What year were you born in? 2008. Yeah, still Z. Still Z. Are you Z? Millennial. Millennial. Millennials 96. Huh? 97. So if you just yeah, okay. see. Yeah, yeah, in between Z <laughs> and Millennial. Okay. Okay. So then. So we've got this, um, we've got the boomers here, like yourselves. Yes, I'm partners. a boomer, huh? <laughs> but baby. Baby boomer. <laughs> However, the, the following generations, uh, I feel they've not uh, progressed in that same uh, speed as your generations have. We feel like we have, like in terms of uh, technological advances. But for example, if I take your example, you set up an uh, organization and it became the uh, biggest Muslim-led organization, uh, charity in the in the West, for example. But then in, from our generation, we don't find anybody doing that type of thing either. So how can we try to do more, if you understand what I mean? I think the problem is that you are 100% relying on the technology which is slowed your thinking ability down in the good old days we used to bus it you know bus it leg it walk it singing under the rain dancing under the rain you don't sing or dance under the rain because you have a car <laughs> singing at, my, at, I, I, my, at my time I didn't have a car I was a medical doctor but still was using the buses and the coaches to go to the hospital. Okay. This was giving us the ability is to release our thinking ability to look around, to observe, to digest, then to reflect what we have, to read. I tell you something, how many of us now in this room read from a book nowadays? Paper book, not Mr. Haji, Google or uh, sister uh, Wikipedia. How many? Nobody. Why? Because we, do, we don't think it's, 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 it's good for the time. The people who would like to make the change, you go back to the textbooks, go back to the encyclopedia, go back to the history and read. That's why when you are in London, when I used to travel to London day in and day out, in the underground, most of the young people like you, whether generation Z or millennial or baby boomer, two, not one, standing up with one hand holding the, the, ray. the ray and act with the other one holding a book, even sitting there, why they are reading the paper book and are not reading the paper book? This is something which is a challenge for you. Why we don't listen? to a long talk, which is very fruitful, very educative, very informative. Oh, no, no, I want five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, oh my God, and go on. You will never learn from two minutes or three minutes or five minutes. It will be just like a flashlight. But if you want here to learn, you have to, you have to be patient to sit down and absorb the knowledge from the one who is speaking to you, or even the discussion. When you discuss things together, you have to sit down together for an hour or two to plan, to think together collectively, then to try. This is something, because of the speed of technology, overcome the thinking ability of the Generation Z. Nowadays, the Generation Z becomes very slow in building what has been built by the forefather or the grandfather and the mothers in the past. I tell you something else. If you go back to your mother's or your grandmother's uh, side and father, you find how many children? Your uncles or your aunties? Seven, eight, nine? And one woman who's one man, maybe working in the farm, working in a factory, and she is looking after eight or nine children. She's looking after the house, a very strong woman, very capable woman, very patient woman, and the father going out from after Fajr, five, six in the morning, coming back after uh, Zuhr, then going back again for about 10 or 12 or 15 hours. To produce whom? To produce learned people like yourself, or like your father, or like your uncle, or like your auntie. Those people managed to do it with love, with caring, with compassion, and with a vision, because they wanted to build the family 
They wanted to build the community, they wanted to build the society, they wanted to build the nation. This is actually the uneducated grandma and grandpa who brought your father and mother to life. That last point um, was really important, I feel, uh, building a nation and building a community. Um, and as you said, that was what the, our previous generations, or the previous generations, our fathers, our, four, our grandfathers, generations, they did. Yeah. However, our generations, I, just from just being on the street, meeting people, meeting people my age, meeting even people younger, they're just looking at their own benefit for everything now. Compared to before, even, I think me and you were having a discuss, discussion yesterday, like uh, per, um, previously parents would do everything for their child. Yes. So in, within my own family, like I've got an auntie, she'd do something, she'd, she purchased so many houses for the sake of her children. Yeah. When it comes to now my generation now, I've got a, I've got a son, or my friends that I've got children, we were like, no, we'll let them work and do that themselves. Mm. So how did that, why did that mindset change? Is it because of them living, um, do you feel like it's because of them living in the West or is it just a general global uh, mindset that's been changing? I think okay. this was coming from the culture of the extended family. At the generation of your grandfather, your grandmother, actually they were living in the bigger houses as auntie, uncle, grandpa, and parents as well. This collectiveness was like the smaller community which is building the society. I'll tell you something, why the divorce rate nowadays is higher than it was at the time of your mother or your grandmother and your grandfather. Why? Because the young children or Generation Z or Millennial, think we're independent. Don't nag me. Don't give me a headache. Don't argue with me. Okay, if you keep arguing, go. We separate. Easy to break a family. Why? Because she has the income, he has the income, and we don't sit down together objectively to look at our future generation that we need to bring it together. So if, if, if I'm upset with you as a husband, or I'm upset with you as a wife, okay, alas, we separate. Alaikum Assalam. Yeah, Bismillah, come on, this way. Okay. Uh, so the easiest thing is to say, peace be upon you, let us separate. Which is no patience. You are not getting married for the sake just of marrying somebody who is beautiful. What's next? There's a responsibility, there are children, there are extended families, there are bills they are going to pay for the electricity and they are a headache, the children are sick, the children are not sick. Sometimes uh, she does the cooking and you don't like the cooking, you start to argue, why should you argue? Okay? She does her best to make you happy and you have to do your best to make her happy. This kind of patience between the two partners in the house has to be there. This was there at the time of your parents or your grandparents because they were objectively looking at you as their future. They were investing as, at you as their future. And they're spending all their money and their time and their effort on you because you are their future. And they believed at that time that when they grow up, somebody will look after them at their old age or somebody will make prayer for them after they pass away. This was the link between the parents or the grandparents and the younger generation. Nowadays, it's money, 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 fast, 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 run, 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 run. If you give me a headache, they are out. If I give you a headache, kick me out. As easy as that, which is not, this will never, will never build a community. And as you said, I think um, there's two things. One thing is, um, as a family unit, even now we see it everywhere we go, uh, houses, nobody is actually eating as a family anymore. Mm. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> Just as, as the years go past, every year it happens now. I'll take the field, I'll go to my bedroom, this person will go to the bedroom, and everybody's separate. Do you feel that um, also has something as small as just sharing a meal together yeah. once a day? Does that have an impact? On that? And did that have an impact even for you, for example, when you were yeah. being raised as a child? To well, that, to that? When we were raised as, a ch as children, if I get you the, the Egyptian style of the family there, we used to sometimes eat on a table or something called tabliya. You know tabliya in Arabic? Yeah, the small uh, table. The small 
يعني اون ذا فلور ذا فلور تيبل اور نو تيبل وير ايفري بودي از ذير ماي فاذر يوز تو كم هوم ات 2 او كلوك سو ذا دينر ويل بي ات 2 او كلوك اند ويل بي سيستا افتر ذات فروم 2 تو 4 وي ويك اب تو دو اور ستاديز اكشولي اند اور فاذر اور ويل اكسبكت ان اكسبكتد جيستس There was no telephones, there was no internet, there was no communication. Any member of the family can walk in after five o'clock without any warning. This is how our culture was to receive anybody. Open door policy. Open, uh, open, open door policy. <laughs> open door policy. We just discussed what's the difference between open door policy discussion and the closed door policy discussion. And this was actually being brought up in this way. So we used, we used to sleep, the sisters used to sleep or the daughters used to sleep in one room. And the brother used to be sleeping in another, all of them, whether they are three or four. Sometimes the, the girls sleep on one bed because we don't have, we cannot afford to have two or three beds in the room. Maybe two beds, uh, two, two sisters on one on bed, three, sometimes three sisters on one bed, the same for the brother. This was a collectiveness at that time, without being poisoned. But the Western culture of telling us, separate, 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 separate. Don't touch, don't touch, don't touch, don't, don't, don't touch, okay? This is happening to us. This is one of the negative impact of the communication. Because we absorb sometimes culture, which is not our culture, values, which are not our values, and actually morality, which is not our moralities. And we swallow it. Then we, uh, we unfortunately behave according to this. This is something which we look at the fashion. The fashion, especially the fashion, the most obvious for the girls and the boys, whether the drop, the backdrop trousers, you know what they call it, backdrop trousers, backdrop trousers, and belly button, you know the belly button, backdrop, yeah, when, when, you, when, the, when my trousers goes down and you go to the mosque, so why should I look at uh, whatever it is, what, no, and, and he's going to pray in the mosque, and you can see, not you, <laughs> him, he can see his back, whatever they call it. Or the belly button sisters, when actually the, the short T-shirt. So why, why should I look at this? This is the fashion. Or the, the trouser which you, you, you buy it as brand new, intact, and you keep cutting it. Why you cut it? Why you cut it? Not you. Anyway, what I'm trying to say, we are affected or being driven by the culture of the new civilization, which is impacting us. Uh, as I said earlier, you, in your generation, uh, we were one and we were two, and even Generation X, you could say, uh, prior to the Millennials, everything, they did a lot, they created organizations, they created, uh, they laid the foundations, they did everything for us, however, the, everything I feel was still slow, in a sense that, you, you know, you'd sit back, everything's going fast, you're doing everything fast, but you're still, you're still taking time to reflect, you're still thinking, you're still thinking, however, now, Society is just extremely fast, as you mentioned earlier. We now on YouTube, for example, or Instagram, the you know people only like to watch videos that are 30 seconds long, 20 yeah. seconds. It goes shorter and shorter. Last maybe four years ago, it was five minutes, yeah. four minutes, three minutes. Now 30 seconds, 20 seconds. People, their attention span is going shorter, and everybody wants something to stimulate them uh, straight away. They want different things to stimulate them, and everything's fast. But nobody's taking that time up to to think. How could we do that in this generation? Because I think, as I, as I mentioned, you have to be patient and you have to struggle against yourself. What we call it, mujahadat al-nafs. Mujahadat al-nafs in doing the good at the time when everybody else does the bad thing. A hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says, أَتَى الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا Islam came as a strange, strange religion. And will come back as a strange religion. Tuba al-Ghuraba give a glad tidings to those strangers, to those strangers. He said, who are the strangers, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Strangers are those ones who are decreasing the bad behavior, actually when everybody else is doing it, and they increasing the good behavior when everybody else is doing the bad behavior. And this actually the patient. Another hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who said, the man, it will come a time where the one amongst you in this room will be looking after his deen or her deen is like the one who is holding in hand, in his hand what? In his hand? Huh? Hot coal. 
برنينج نوت هوت برنينج هوت ذيس فور بتي برنينج كول اور يعني وتش كانوت ذيس از دين ناو ديز ا لوت اوف ديستراكشن ا لوت اوف فولس انفورميشن اون ذا اون ذا اون ذا سوشيال ميديا ا لوت اوف فولس انفورميشن اون ذا ستيت ميديا ا لوت اوف انفورميشن وتش يو كانوت اكشولي ابزورب اند يو بيكم بيكم كونفيوز ذاتس واي وار يو يونج جينيريشن كانوت absorb all this at our time the communication was less that's why we have the time to think to reflect to connect to visit to travel i think one of the things now with the young people should be doing is having a program of reading having a program of traveling to uh, the open spaces like forests like mountains these challenges when you reflect yourself to the creation of Allah and you enjoy this kind of togetherness when you are going to India to the Himalaya isn't it or going to the western desert or western Sahara in Morocco or other places to see or to be cut off of the social media cut off of the telephone can we survive this is the challenge what to call it mujahadat al-nafs to struggle against ourselves Can we live without our telephone for a day or two or a week or two or not? And we still become functioning? And this is the challenge. We don't want you to uh, lose the communication or the connection, but we want us as young people to be able to be using the technology and to work without technology at the same time. Actually, and the gardening reading, all the young people, or not all, most of the young people in the West are very good readers. And we are living in the West, and young people don't read. We won't like this 20 second. It's not even a sandwich. It's a leg, is it? Taster. What do you call, call it? Leg? Yeah, taster. Taster, whatever. Well, taster will be filling you. No, you still be hungry. Unless you cook a proper meal, and this proper meal will be able to uh, make you full. I think we'll keep it uh, open up for any questions. Uh, we welcome everybody. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is Oman. I work as a uh, software developer. Software developer. Yes. Sister? Amina. Amina? Amina, bismillah, mashallah. I'm studying at the Studying what? <laughs> ah, Bismillah, mashallah. So you are going to see the life, <laughs> the birth of life every day, <laughs> many, many times. <laughs> and the screaming and the crying. <laughs> the crying of the woman, then the smile of the woman. <laughs> then the screaming of the boy yeah. or the girl, and then the, the smile. Place. Yeah, all this emotion <laughs> in a few seconds. Okay. Uh, Niswa? Niswa. Yusra. Yusra, Bismillah, mashallah. Construction, Bismillah, Mashallah, Bismillah, Mashallah. Uh, I'm Dean, and I'm taking my exam for uh, GCSE. Bismillah, Mashallah. Bismillah. GCSE, what do you want GCSE to be? Uh, an IT. IT, all IT, no BT. <laughs> you remember the movie called ET, Go Home? Have you seen it? You have to you see, see it. <laughs> Because I am a part of this ET generation. <laughs> ET, go home. <laughs> My name is Bilal, I work for Human Relief Foundation. Bismillah, mashallah. I'm Junaid, I'm one of the fundraising and deployment managers for Human Relief Foundation. Two charity workers, one technological, one should be the, 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 the observer of the, the birth of life every day. Mashallah. And sister is doing her uh, construction. Oh, bismillah, mashallah. And you're going to be a doctor or what? What do you want to be? An IT. IT another again? Okay. Yeah, go on. So, also, I'm in discussion. I think, uh, Dr. Manny, I wanted to ask you, so you mentioned as one of the issues we have nowadays is uh, almost too much independence. Yeah. To the level, uh, a husband doesn't need his wife, a wife doesn't need her husband. So if there's issues between them, why stay together? Why not just, just leave? How do we, how do we build back this, this uh, codependency or interdependency, this need for each other in society? 
I think you have to look objectively at your life as not a, a, a only a life of a young and able man. When I'm a young and able man, and a young and able woman, I can be independent. But what will happen to me when I grow as an old woman and an old man? I'll be lonely, I'll be broken. But even sometimes sister now or brother said, I don't want to get married. I want to live my life. And by, because everybody's around here, everybody around him. But by the age of 40 or 50, nobody uh, is interested in you. Okay? You have to look at this. It's not, the life is not about how strong you are, or how healthy you are, or how uh, what they call mobile you are, or how wealthy you are. The life is about how, what's after that. This is number one. Number two, yeah, we have to know what is the purpose of our life. The purpose of the life of animals and birds is to productivity, to increase their numbers for a benefit. The purpose of life of man, like myself and the sisters and everybody, is to build life for others and build life for ourselves as well and to discover the secrets of this life. To be very honest, if he talks about my, if I have any success story in my life, it goes back to two women, my wife, my, ma my mother first, who taught me how to behave when I was young as a mother, so I was a son. And then my wife, who is behind me 24-7. Without my wife nowadays, I could not have built anything. Okay? That's why this is another angle of it. So to live in this life, you can live alone. But to be productive in this life, you have to have somebody to, have, to give you hand-holding, whether a wife to the husband or a husband to the wife. Last point is we need to coach the young people before getting married for the purpose of marriage. And this might be for, for few courses for people to understand. It's not only about religious education, about community education. What is the purpose of marriage? What is the purpose of the family? was the purpose of being a father and bringing young children to carry your name, then make dua for you and for the mother when we die, when we, do, we leave this world. This kind of cycle has to be there with us. What's the purpose of having a connected, uh, 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 extended family? The family, the in-law from the mother, or the, from the wife, or the in-law from the husband. All this kind of thing is a protective layer for your children. That's why this actually have to look at this as comprehensive uh, structure. You are going to be a structure engineer, so Arch architect. Yeah, quantity. No, 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 I don't want quantity survey. I'm talking about the structure, oh. the structure of the family. You look at the structure of the family. Your family with your husband, then your mother and father, then your in-law, and actually uh, the uh, your husband in-law as well, and so on. So you find this all is as a big structure. Without it, we cannot build a community, cannot build a society, cannot build a nation, cannot build civilization. That's why nowadays Europe are uh, inviting young people to come here. Because they decided to go this way. No husband, no marriage, no, 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 no. Now it's aging societies. And most of them are in elderly, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, old people's home. Do you want to be like this? You don't want to have children when they, we grow up and to come and tell you, or grandchildren, to come and be with you and help you. And I remember a statement by somebody called Omar Sharif. You remember Omar Sharif? Well, the superstar, as a movie star. Uh, he, looks, <laughs> he looks like me. Uh, Omar Sharif, actually, you know, after becoming this super cinema star, come on, sister. This super uh, cinema star, actually, uh, when he became Alzheimer, uh, an old, senile man, you know what he said later on in his life? I wish I could have built a family and not become a superstar. I wish I could have built a family and not become a superstar. Because he realized at his age of 70 and 80 and whatever it is, nobody 
is coming to him as a star. He is not star anymore. Finished. His starship period is gone with the wind. Any other question from the sisters, from the brother? Thank you, sister. Where you come from? From the Mars? Or from Jupiter? <laughs> from Jupiter, huh? You came, you came by car or you came by uh, spaceship? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> you want to ask any question? Yes, sister. Cool. Yes, Ms. Mila. Can you discuss something about values? Um, what advice would you give the youth to um, adhere to their values? Because in this society, there seems to be a big confusion, confusion with regards to what sort of standards to adhere to. The be if, if we are Muslims, the best standard, without any hesitation, is the standard of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Very simple. I was in Istanbul and the, the talk was about simple people. Simple people are the people who are guarding us. Simple people are the people who are standing up at night, at night to protect us. Simple people are the people who are driving their cars, our cars. Simple people are the people who are cleaning the roads. Simple people are the people who are prophets and messengers of God. They are simple people. The life is very simple. They were very transparent. Moses, alayhi salam, Jesus, alayhi salam, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam, Ibrahim and the others. We know the story inside out. Simple people. What we need to do, sister, is to rise to the standard of the value of the simple people who made the difference and made the change and made the change. To rise to the standard of the, of the simple people who made the change. Was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is a complicated character? No. Was Jesus was a complicated character? No. Was Moses? No. Was Abraham? No. Yusuf? No. All of them are very simple. Very transparent. They were like an open book. You can read them inside out. Why we should complicate our values, our moral system, our philosophy of thinking, our culture? It is there, actually, uh, given to us by the simple people. Mm -hmm. The problem is that actually we are confused because we are over-explaining or over-addressing simple issue by very complicated theological or philosophical discussion. This is our problem. Take it simply, and the most important thing about values is you as a role model. You walk the walk. You talk the talk, you walk the walk. Mm -hmm. So people will say that, Sister uh, Yasmin? Uh, ah, Yusra, Yusra. Yusra, isn't it? Sister Yusra, she says what she does. Or she does what she says. That's it. Because she is competent, she is knowledgeable, and she lives a very simple life. And for you, as a midwife, Bismillah, mashallah, your experience will be magnificent. Because every day you will see three, four, five cases. Each one of them have got a different story. Or each one of them has different stories. But actually that you will absorb. But when you absorb, try to write down. To learn what you, what, what you were, were actually uh, taught from these cases. Because you, show, you saw the husband, you saw the in-laws, you saw the babies, you saw the, the, the mother when they were, the, the, children, the babies were born out. And this was the most rewarding moment in the life of a woman. And the, the reward from Allah is abundant. Abundant. You cannot imagine. No matter what your son will do to you, it will never become equivalent to the moment of agony when you are actually pushing the baby outside the womb of the mother. Simple life, make great values. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Hassan, nice to meet you. Obviously, you founded Islamic Relief, mashallah. Yes, Islamic Relief. When you first started initially, um, I can imagine over time there was a lot of admiration towards yourself um, that you had. Um, what do you mean admiration, admiration towards myself? Admiration from some, 
to the point where you were... I was a very handsome man. Of course. And that was what you were Nothing changed. No, no. I'm just pulling his legs. As you saw climb the leadership and rank, and when you saw the successes of Islam, I believe, I think, to begin with, please correct me if I'm wrong, of course, the intention must have been pure and clear, and you know, when you initially start, and that's what causes the success of any project. And eventually, over time, when you do something like that, you do see the success, it's very easy for things to get to you and get to your head, um, for, for, the, for the devil to come and, and make you feel like you're, you, you may start to look down on someone or whatever. So what advice would you give to anyone within this sort of field, within the humanitarian sector or whatever it is, even if they're getting paid, how to continuously rectify the intentional, intention uh, and not to sort of look down on others? Because yeah. um, we know that Allah says the only exception that people have thought about, right? So how do we get to that level? I think you have to keep looking back at the purpose. The purpose, why you are here in this organization. Are you here for a job, for a salary, or for a mission? Okay. In my case, I never looked at it as something that keep climbing. Because I am like uh, those contractors, you know, since you are an engineer, construction engineer, who go to a piece of land, and try to dig a slum area. To try to clear the slum and tell the people, hey guys, come here, this is a very uh, fertile land, or it's a very precious land because it has got gold or silver and others. This is where we look at it. Sometimes people, when they come at this level, they only look at objectively at what they want to do for the community. To keep it going on, you have to be remembering all the time why you are working here for. That's why keep connecting yourself to the people that you claim that you are helping them. Keep connecting yourself to the women and the children and the elderly. and the sp Like nowadays, if we look what happened now on, on, in, in, uh, in Pakistan, in Sudan, in Afghanistan, and in Somalia, Africa, and Asia. Disaster of climate change. Okay? Climate change is hitting Pakistan badly with a flooding which I have never seen before, and hitting, actually, Sudan as well, and hitting Somalia in a drought and famine, and hitting also Afghanistan in the Drought is, is affecting it, and others, the east of Africa. Here you look at it, not as numbers of people are affected, but the lives, the souls, the spirits, the future of the people in this area. And put your shoes in their feet. Oh, sorry, your feet in the shoes. Put your feet in the shoes. Said so if I was born there, and if I was there today, what could have happened to me, to my mother, to my father, to my sister, to my wife, to my children? And say, Alhamdulillah, this is where the taqwa comes. When we compare ourselves to the people who are less fortunate than ourselves. When we are comparing ourselves to the people who are deprived. The people of Syria, 10, 11 years now, living in no man's land. Inside Syria, as displaced people, or the people of Yemen. 20 million are actually affected by poverty and hunger. The same in Afghanistan, the same in Somalia. And here, if you look at your job as a salary and images of those young children, you will never reach the level of taqwa. But if you look at your job as you are privileged that Allah has given you the opportunity to work for this life, to earn money and save other people, here, to thank Allah, and the more you thank Allah, the more your taqwa will increase. Yeah. Just a follow-up question. Please. Yes, sir. So, I actually work for a charity, and most of my job is digital marketing, um, yeah. managing your website. So I don't actually get to like see the, at first hand what's going on. You have to demand that, and I don't want, I don't want to know the name of your charity. It's Islamic. I don't want to know the name of your charity. <laughs> I do not know it. No. You have to demand a face-to-face -face meeting 
with the orphans, with the widows, with the elderly, with the displaced. Otherwise, you'd be just a, a, a desk sitting on a desk, or a screen looking at a screen, or a, what do you call it, a, a, a puppet, or what do, you, what do you call it? Yeah, a puppet. Yes, uh, oh, okay. I keep repeating uh, numbers and for, for the sake of raising funds. This should be a part of the educational system of the organization. This be a part of the upbringing of the generation to come. The future leadership, the young leaders of the organization. And if the organization does not <coughs> believe in that, it could become a, a dead meat or a dead wood literal. And you have to demand not only yourself, at least once or twice a year to go to visit the field, even if there is no program, tell them, I will pay for my ticket. Please send me there. Ask them to send you for secondment for a month or two or three, and you can work. do your work from Khartoum, or do your work from Islamabad, or do your work from uh, uh, Sana'a, or from whatever place where you actually you, you feel you feel the mission and you see that the message that they put and the value they put on their websites, you, feel, you see it in action. If they don't send you there, you'll become a dead meat. No matter how intelligent or how highly educated or how uh, eloquent or how gifted you are, you will be rusty later on. That's why, you see, most of the time I feel down, I used to go to travel to these countries and I come back highly energetic and highly empowered. By whom? By the young children and the elderly people and the women and the sick and the displaced and the refugees and the poor people. Yes, sister? Construction? Yes? Anybody? Um, I've got another question. Um, Doctor, you, me you mentioned about how uh, nowadays, because we're we're so overexposed to social media, we've always we're always consuming. Yes. Uh, what are some practical steps that, that we can take to just take a step back and reflect? I know you said maybe going out and traveling sometimes. Are there any other pra practical steps that we can take just to reflect on our experiences? I feel like a lot of times nowadays we have a lot of experiences, but we don't actually reflect and benefit from them because it's just onto the next one, onto the next one, and uh, constant. You start new initiatives. You start new trials. Now, if you have a group of children very close to you, and if sister, uh, if you remember yourself, Amina. Amina, sister Amina, had a great idea. She could not let her to sleep at night. She woke up and she called upon all of you. We want to do, I have this great idea. You sit down as a group and start a new initiative. But when you start this in your initiative, you have to be realistic. Don't overdo it. Don't do it on a national level. Do it on a very local level where it has an impact and will be affecting the local community. So all of you will uh, follow Sister Amina, not because you see Sister Amina, follow the idea of Sister Amina. And every now and then, meet the challenge. One time, 2006, we were trying to go to South Lebanon. At that time, it was Habib Malik. Anybody knows Habib Malik? Anyway, he's in Pakistan now. And uh, we drove in a car, which is eight-seater. At that time, the Israeli forces were actually hitting all the eight-seaters, the big ones, because they thought that it's a part of Hezbollah in South Lebanon. And to try to calm down everybody, we started a discussion. You know what was the discussion about? How to make the fear to become afraid of you. How to make the fear becoming afraid of you. How? You answer. I'm just not, it's just a question, by the way. <laughs> they are listening to me. It's a question. Yes, sister Yusra. How to make the fear afraid of you? Everybody was thinking, 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 thinking. The time passed and they found ourselves inside Saida at the time. Alhamdulillah, we won. 
But answer me now. The question on the table now. How you make the fear afraid of you? By becoming fearless yourself. How? Be greater than your fear. How? Your ambition, your hopes. How? Everything that you're afraid of, do it. How? Have tawakkul in Allah. Huh? Belief in Allah. How? Oh. No, no, okay, no. <laughs> it's very simple. How? How? <laughs> Laugh. <laughs> Laugh, okay. How you, be, how you make the fear become afraid of you? Go and meet the fear. Face it. Face it. You'll find it's like a mirage. Once you meet the fear, the first few seconds, the first few minutes, you will be in this turmoil. When it passed, it's gone. it's gone. That's actually, sometimes when actually these things which we need to learn to do, to uh, get us out of this. But you have to have a, a, a group of friends. Maybe meet once a week. Or it depends on how, how, how regular you can be. But try to make new initiatives all the time. To keep everybody busy. To keep everybody busy, keep everybody busy, and this kind, this, this, you consume the time according to what you need to use the time. Otherwise, to be, wallahi well, al-azim, give me, give me a telephone, give me a telephone. If I'm alone at home, you know, have you seen I'm alone one, I'm alone two? Yeah. I'm home alone one. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm alone, if home alone, so not home alone one, when you are home alone, when you are home alone, with this, five, six hours will pass without notice. Mm. That's why you have to force yourself. I think somebody is ordering this. No, no, I, 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 I had, I had something. I think it's 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 okay. <laughs> As actually, if you keep, keep yourself busy, keep yourself. Busy writing, busy thinking, busy reflecting, busy reading, busy meeting your chair, your, your, your brother and sister, busy uh, uh, visiting your friends, visiting your uh, family members. Having a small community project on the local level. This will actually, we are not saying you cut off yourself 100% of telecommunication of the social media, but at least control your time. Mm. At least consume your time. Especially when you have your children. I am one of them. You are young. Bismillah, mashallah, bismillah, mashallah. Bismillah, mashallah, bismillah, mashallah. Bismillah, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. So uh, when you have, you have a program for them. Because you are investing your life, your money, your effort, your time on them. They are the, they are the, the, the most precious investment in your life. This is how you look at to keep yourself busy. I think that's really profound what you said. To keep yourself busy because if you don't, the phone will keep you busy. Of course. <coughs> Everything. Will be. And don't act as being a consumer. What actually uh, uh, those uh, capitalist system always changing people into consumers by maybe uh, bombarding them with very cheap uh, product, so they will stop you producing what you can produce, what used to produce in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Egypt and Libya and other. No, 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 no need, no need. When you bring it from China, it will be cheaper. It will be more cheaper when you produce it locally, where it becomes very expensive at the very beginning. You know why? Because after five years, it will become cheap. And the investment will be home. So you can improve. You can develop. But when you buy the cheap one from the superpower, or from actually this kind of big countries, you will never develop your country. Because all the investment will be in their country, in their research. Yes, yes, brothers, sisters.
Somebody uh, sent in a question. They said, um, what can we do to combat climate change effectively and better prepare developing countries for natural disasters? I we saw what happened in Pakistan and you see Somalia the drought. Um, how can we prepare? What can we do? And, you know, as people, we're not governments, you can't do the level of these things to develop in this, but what can we do? I think it's lobbying to start with, but collective lobbying. Collective lobbying with a clear objective. Actually, by telling those industrial countries enough is enough. By those to tell these multinational companies enough is enough. By telling those people enough is enough. And then treat the impact of climate change. Like I say, you know how many billions of gallons uh, of water been falling onto of Pakistan nowadays and it's going in vain. Where can we have a water reservoir or dams actually to be prepared to receive this one? But with one hand, advocacy to our governments, advocacy to the international organizations such as United Nations. Unfortunately, one thing the United Nations in is the veto system. An organization with a veto system will never be able to go forward. And how many times this veto system stopped development or stopped finding solution to uh, the different problems, which are called Syria, called Palestine, call it others, Yemen, call it whatever it is. It's stopping them. But keep lobbying them, keep lobbying your own government. And actually, even sometimes people might tell you, keep boycotting the buying the product of those <coughs> countries who are actually spoiling or uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, what do you call it in the climate? Uh, spoiling the climate? No. Uh, polluting. polluting, polluting the climate, polluting the climate. You know the first one, I think, China, yeah. followed by America, I think and Russia. Russia. Between these three, it's about 50% of the pollution coming from three countries. 50% of the pollution coming from these three countries. Um, yes. I have a question. It's in regard to the Pakistani flood. Question one, you know... Pakistani flood. The Pakistani flood. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of our donors, for example... You, you know, by the way, my Facebook page today sent me my visit to Pakistan 2010. Oh. Oh. 2010. Oh, what happened in 2010? Flood. Another flood. Yeah. Another flood. So it comes back to me. And last week or the week before, there was another flooding in Djibouti. In Somalia. Same, same. Carry on. You know, um, a lot of other donors within the charity sector, within these areas, are like people from the Asian subcontinent. Yeah. And a lot of people feel now that a lot of charities. I don't know why that they say that when a disaster happened in the Arab world, i.e. the Palestinians or the Syrians, they say the charities act effectively, they go out there. They said when it came to like the Pakistan floods, a lot of charities didn't go out to get to go. Do you feel that when disasters like this happen, charities should go out there straight away as an emergency response or can they work from their own country as well? It depends on the scale of the uh, disaster. Uh, Palestine is an exceptional case because it's connected globally. So you have to take it outside of this discussion. <coughs> Yemen and Syria is catastrophic because of the number of people that are affected. And now Yemen is seven years old. Syria is nearly 11 years old, unfortunately, with a huge number of people not going to schools, homeless, whatever you call it, displacement. Inside Syria, about 7 million people are displaced. Outside Syria, about 5, 6, 6 million people at least in three neighboring countries. Okay. Uh, in UK, most of the charity are Asian-led. And when I was observing my Facebook, the, the CEO of two large organizations are there, which is... Uh, Muslim Hands and Islamic Relief. Okay. Incidentally, uh, Islamic Relief was there because he was visiting before and he has to stay. 
That's why sometimes you have to make a strategic decision of sending people actually to cover the highlights of this disastrous, uh, 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 what do you call it? disaster yeah. uh, affecting uh, Pakistan. If I was in a charity, I could have jumped on the plane on the first day to be there. Because giving the message from the field at the time when people need to see you there is different than giving the message from your office or a local uh, the, uh, officer giving the message on your behalf. Yeah. And this is the impact. So when the CEO of the Khair Foundation or the CEO of Penny Appeal or the CEO of Human Appeal is there nowadays, actually it is the message is, is actually global. It's not like when a local uh, individual there. But don't discriminate, be very honest. Because I had this discussion, which was very, I have to make it public. Can I, Sister uh, Amina? With your permission. Because you are the observer of the birth of life every day. Is that right? Somebody called me that I'm a pro-Pakistani. <laughs> Seriously. I said, what? He said, you are favoring Pakistani to others. I said, how? I go back to the history of the organization. It was Yemeni. It was Indian. It was English. The, pe the first people who started. Eritrean, half Irish, half uh, Egyptian. And uh, Yemeni, another Yemeni. And two or three uh, Egyptian as well as two Lebanese. This is from the inception. I said, but you're wearing Shirwani when you met the queen. <laughs> yes. I'm serious. I said, yes, purposely I wore it. You know why? Because try to acknowledge the people who stood up with the penny and half a penny and the pound and two pound at the 80s, during the 80s and giving me this from the, from the first line in the mosque. It was not this community or this community or this community, it was the Asian community. Because the Asian community in the UK are the largest community, which mainly Pakistani, Indian and Bengali. So when I went to see the Queen, I went with a message. If you honor me, don't honor me as Hanid Banna, but honor the Asian community who built this organization. This was the... I have nothing to do with, 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 with but actually with, 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 with the country, with the people, but it has something to do with the credibility. Wallahi, I remember in the 80s, in Nanitun and in Coventry <coughs> Mosque, and what's next to in Rugby Mosques, the 70 and 80 years old in the front line, giving me the half a penny. The half a penny, and the pay at the time there was half a penny. Have you seen it? Yes. Mm. Generation Z? <laughs> what do you call it? <laughs> what? Tapas is two, two pence. Two pence. Half a penny. Half a penny. Not from that time. <laughs> no, not from my time. <laughs> but we discussed it before you came. Half a penny. And we used to, 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 to keep counting this money when I used to, We used to go around with the Asian community every day. In Ramadan from day one till the last day. Never go back to have a iftari with our family, not only myself, myself and other people like Jangir, Malik, like uh, Anwar Khan, who was in America now, like other people in Germany and France, those people never had iftari with the family for a whole month. And this is how this organization was built. And this is how the taqwa comes back to you. You know what was the book you were reading during that time? A book. Book, paper book, huh? not not Hajja, Hajja Google and uh, mm. Sister uh, Wikipedia. Mm. Huh? It was Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was the grandson of Omar ibn Khattab. His lifestyle and his social justice. This was what we were reading to the people in the mosque for the whole month of Ramadan. From France to Belgium to Holland to America. And those people at the time, brothers and sisters, never make any distinction between Arabs, Pakistani, Indian, Bengali, nothing. 
all were all, all focused objectively on the people in need. You know why? Because the people who paid your salary, Mr. Kari, no, not Mr. Kari, no, Mr. Fundraiser, or Deployer, huh? Deployer? Um, not quite, me. Uh, <laughs> are those people under water in Pakistan? And those people in displacement inside Syria, or in Yemen, or in Somalia, cannot find the clean water to drink. Those people are the people who are paying your salary as a humanitarian worker. So you have to stand up with dignity for them, because they are the real employer. You are the real employer and you are the employee. And this is our message. Do you have any questions? Or? Yeah, it's up to you. Anything else? I wish I could have a list prepared now. <laughs> um, as uh, you spoke earlier about the response uh, in Bangal and the climate change type um, and how we can lobby uh, local governments and local councils and about things like that, going back to the humanitarian sector, um, you said that we can go on the ground, people can go on the ground, they can raise awareness and raise funds. Once the funds are raised, what should they do? What for, for anything? So, for example, Pakistan the floods. People will raise funds, they'll do a quick solution relief. Somalia, they'll raise funds for drought, they'll get them, you know, water access to water for a short amount of time and then leave. What, what should a charity do? What should an organization do? What should an individual do? Or what should their plan be? Should there be a long term goal or is it just all short term? No, I think you raise funds for a purpose. And I keep, I, I, I mentioned this long time ago about even at the time of war, from day one, when you raise the fund for humanitarian response, you divide it into two parts. One is a traditional humanitarian response, food, water, sanitation, shelter, and health, which is about 70% of your fund. The 30% is to build the community. You have to start building the community from day one. You have to start building the capacity of the individuals from day one. You have to start building the municipality, local municipality from day one. Because you don't wait till the camera of the media leave that place. Nobody will give you money. Strategically, you have actually to divide the share to 70% to 30%. You have to educate Sister uh, Amina as a donor. Uh, please, Sister Amina, I'm not going to spend the 100 pounds you give to me on food. I'll spend 70 and the 30 I'll do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You have to raise the awareness of the people that during this flood, during this disaster, you have to divide it about the long term and short term. Short term will be spent instantly within six months to one year. Long term will stay to prevent it happening again. Actually, and that's why you have to have this. That's why from the, from the day one in organizing your organization or establishing your organization or building an organization, you have to look objectively on three long term programs. First one is Waqf, to put in the system of fundraising from the day one of registering a charity, number one. Number two, research. Don't ever go without having a research, actually based information, because your lobbying for the government will never be a nice speech only. It has to be research based paper. Number three, building the future generation. Sister like uh, Yusra, brother Dean. Dean, which Dean? All the Deans? <laughs> brother Dean from day one. You know, Alhamdulillah, when I was in the organization, Anwar Khan was 17. <laughs> Anwar Khan now is in the 50. Jangir was the same, or more or less, and the others. 
those people, when you take them by hand from the very beginning, they become leaders while you are there in the organization. The third project is keep thinking objectively on what? On building future leadership. Number four, start writing the history from day one. Don't let your organization become 30 or 40 years old when everybody die or leave or travel. And say, oh my God, we did not know how we started. We need to collect those tools back. These four projects from the very beginning will give you sustainability and direction. During your, your, your time as a founder, if you start with Yusra and with Dean at their age as volunteers, Yusra and Dean will become the CEO in 15, 20 years time. But if you don't start with them and you ignore them and you give them to somebody as an employee or just look at them, oh yeah, come in and distribute some, some leaflets and go here and there, they wouldn't be interested. Walk future generation, research, and history. To start making the stability for the organization. Does anybody have any more questions? Just a quick question. So, from what I understand... Who can drink this one? Somebody has to... Hadi, Badi, Sidi, Muhammad, Al-Baghdadi, Shalu, Hattu, Kullu, Aladi, Yib, Ayusra. Yib, Umm Ayusra. Huh? خلاص مستر دين دين أو سنة سلاج الدين بسم الله ما شاء الله is it let's go so the thirty percent is to encourage towards the self sufficiency of the wherever the money is going how did you come out with the seventy to thirty ratio what 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 generated you to go to that figures I'm guessing it's based on your experience yeah how old am I now I'm seventeen Yes, I thought you were 19, but you're doing well. No, no, 19 still. <laughs> not yet. I did not reach 19 yet. I'm still 17. 17, yes, yeah, reverse it. <laughs> and uh, I think it, as you said, from experience. Mm. To be very honest, your name? Nadim. Nadim. Brother Nadim, when you are in the field for 40 years, you have the right to give opinion. You have the right to make opinion. You have the right to make fatwa as mufti, if you are theologian or a social mufti like myself. Know some speciality in humanitarian work or social work or community work because of your experience. You have seen it a lot. And this gave you the right to stand up and say, I say, as a mufti, social mufti, 70-30, 75-25. But not less than 25. You know why? Because when the camera goes away and there's no media, nobody will give you any pain. I'll tell you, I'll tell you now. See how, how much everybody is affected by Pakistan, 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 Pakistan. All right, next month. Change the chapter. Pakistan will be at the bottom of the list. Some other, other, other problem will be at the top of the list. So at the moment, my fatwa. It's a social fatwa, by the way, not theological fatwa, not religious fatwa. My social fatwa is 30-70. I raise, maybe organization X raise about $10 million or pound for Pakistan. Three million at least has to stay behind to do long-term project for those people, for their livelihood, income generation, uh, building roads, uh, building uh, economy, training people, all these kind of things. And the 60 to 70 percent is quick response. And this is an experience. It's what works best from the Yeah, the, uh, even now, some, something called triple nexus. Nexus is a conne connection. Now, the, 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 the big Western or, or the consultant in the Western organization saying the same with different terminology. We have to start, create our own terminology. Yeah. Like actually, at the very beginning, we said uh, before you, before most of you came, Generation Z. Uh, who is giving the definition of Generation Z? No. It's the people who put it. Somebody from here, okay? Generation Z, uh, Millennial, uh, G uh, Generation X, Boomer, Boomer Two, B 
بي بومار 1 بوست وور وورد وور 2 جي الفا الفا وتش از تشيز الفا تشيز ديناش الفا ناو يور دوتر ذيس وان يا تشيز الفا لا لا شو اسك وات الفا جو تو ا براذر جوجل ويل تيل يو اند جريتست جينيريشن وتش از 1901-1927-and-Sala-Generation-28-248-because-the-World-War-1-and-World-War-2-who's-putting-this-definition-did-you-put-it-did-you-put-it-somebody-put-it-so-why-don't-I-as-calling-myself-the-generation-Z-start-
or the day after the day. The day before yesterday, it was Thursday. It was two hours open discussion. People from North Africa, people from West Africa, people from Syria, people from Egypt, people from Turkey. They want to listen. They want to be a part of the discussion. I think there's hunger for the young people to learn. Because they don't want to learn from one side of the coin only. It's our duty nowadays, brothers and sisters, to teach our philosophy, to teach our culture, to teach our values, to teach our history, and to train our young people to become young future leaders according to the moral values of our religion. And don't be shy of saying, I am taking this from Islam. So what? You know when you say so what? With arrogance? Arrogance could be sometimes used. So what? I'm a very proud Muslim. Okay. Let me conclude with one thing. I'm not sure if I have done it. It was you before in another meeting. To conclude, I was in a meeting in Geneva either 2002 or 2003. Top high level UN meeting. With all the, uh, the, the big organizations of UN. And I was wearing Shirwani again. But my beard was, was, uh, was longer. And I felt at this meeting that there's some sort of people trying to make a connection between Islam as a religion and terrorism as uh, a disease. When I'm angry, don't sit in front of me. Okay? And uh, you can ask the people whom I used to work with. Most welcome. Son. That's my uh, son. So you are lit. We're, we're finishing. I have finished. No, come on, come on, come on. Come on. No, no, no. All right, come on, come on. okay. All right, I tell you, all right, all right. I'm just saying. Uh, okay, all right, Hashan, I thought you. Uh, I understood the message and I took the microphone and you know my voice is strong but when I become angry it becomes stronger and stronger I said on this don't ever and never associate Islam with terrorism just boom on them everybody was looking at me Islam is a religion came to save humanity and it did. Then it produced civilization which lasted for 1,000 years from different parts of the globe, from Andalusia, from Syria, from Iraq, from Turkey, from Egypt, from Yemen, whatever you call it. Islam should not be connected to terrorism. And I was talking to every donor organization UN, the big ones, UNSCR, UNFPA, uh, WFP, and all those. Then I went and I came back. The one who took the lead after me was the CEO of Caritas. Caritas is a charitable wing of uh, uh, the Vatican. He was saying, after I left, we feel how the Muslims are suffering. This happened to us during the 70s. You know, the war between the North uh, Ireland and the uh, Irish and the world. And it was building up. My aim to attend this meeting is to meet one director, the director of World Food Program, because it's the largest organization of the United Nations. Its annual budget could be $4 billion. You know, when I went, I came back to the meeting, and I was hoping to shake hands with him to take his car. And he came to me. Said, whenever you are in Rome, come and meet me. I looked at him, looked down at him. Of course, when I visit Rome, I will look, I will come and visit you. I took the car and we invented a, a, a meeting or a visit to Rome between me and my, of my country, that my, uh, my office manager and the representative in Rome, and I went to meet the director of WFP. 
And when I sat down with him, I told him one thing. Did you think that I was very harsh on you people? You know, he said, no. You were very honest. And you gave us a wake-up call. Because we thought that the civilization started 200, 300 years ago. But it really started more than 1,000 years ago. And he invited me to go to speak to the global WFP, the global strategic WFP meeting in uh, Ireland at that time. From just responding or understanding what they want and you put your feet down, don't, don't look at funding. Don't think once or twice that if you say that, funding will stop. And after that, we got a lot of money from WFP to put you on a platform of the global strategic meeting of WFP in Ireland with 350 individuals attending it from all the globe. That means this accreditation for the organization to be supported by all the offices of WFP globally. Just to end on a good note. Marco Lafik, um, that was really insightful and it's, uh, it was a wonderful uh, discussion and sitting down and open and bright discussion, alhamdulillah. Inshallah, we'll hopefully see you again very soon. Now I can listen to you. Inshallah. Come this way. Where is your uh, YouTube? Uh, Patrick. Oh, but uh, oh, you're supposed to be the man of the. What is it from? Are you Z? 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 Or what? Z? Z? And this is the Z. I'm what? I'm baby boom one. And you got everything correct. Okay. Yalla, bismillah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال إبراهيم رب جعل هذا البلد آمنا رب جعل هذا Oh, man, man.
وجعل أفئدة من الناس تهوي إليهم وارزقهم من الثمرات لعلهم يشفعون ربنا إنك تعلم ما نخفي وما نعلن وما يخفى على الله من شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء الحمد لله الذي وهب لي على الكبر إسماعيل وإسحاق إن ربي لسميع ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي ربنا اغفر